Welcome um, to everybody. Um, this is welcome to the Australian College of Physical Education uh, and our Monday Night Coaches Club. But this is our Monday Night Coaches Club on a Wednesday. Um, my name is Gareth Long, and welcome to our special webinar today, where we'll discuss and collaborate coaching ideas for training under COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, some of you will already be doing this. Um, some of you will be getting ready to do this imminently and some of you will be spending a bit of time planning this. But um, whether you're a Monday night regular or you're joining us for the first time or you're from a different sport, I think we're probably going to get some people from other sports joining us today as well because you know, people are in the same situation regardless of whether you're from football or from different sports. So if you're any of the um, above, um, welcome, welcome to the session today. We don't claim to be able to provide all the answers today, but we certainly hope to give a few. Um, so what I'm going to do um, to start with is I'm actually going to start with a video. The video is from um, one of our panelists club today, the under 14s, and I think it's probably a good example of some of the aspects that we'll be talking about today. Bit 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 All right, so as usual, I'd like to introduce my co-hosts um, today, my co-hosts. Um, firstly, Warren Grieve, um, who will be acting as our summariser today. How's it going, Warren? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me again, mate. Always a pleasure. And uh, Drew Taylor? Uh, looking forward to the rest of it being better than me attempting to speak then, and looking forward <laughs> to hearing from Rob and Jack, so thanks for having me back. Excellent, Drew. Look, look. Uh, I, I think if people haven't already guessed, we don't rehearse this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, I'm going to introduce uh, Chris Adams. Hi, all. Just, just to provide a little bit of context for this evening before we delve too deeply into some of the content. Um, this this session is going to be based around the, the first or the steps of the return to training. Um, obviously, it's fantastic that around the country we're starting to see football come back. It's a massive plus for us. Um, that uh, we've come back probably sooner than all of us anticipated. Uh, so it's going to be based around that first step where you're working with 
10 players um, and then that's including you um, as the coach uh, in a small area. What that area looks like is obviously going to be dependent on what state you're viewing from. Uh, I know online we've got um, people from around the country um, here um, on the call. So I'd encourage everyone to log on to your own member federation site just to really familiarize yourself and check the current state of play where you are um i know some states like western australia are now up to 20 people which is obviously fantastic so we're starting to see things look a little bit more like football before this uh but just as the context as we said um this is very much in that first phase where it's 10 players including you as a coach um in a small area but please do check uh with your current um level of play with your own um state federation uh. okay lovely well at the purpose today look i hope we can achieve six things today um one really importantly you want to hear from our two panelists and i'll, I'll introduce them very shortly we also want you to spend time with the fellow coaches that have joined in. I'm looking down at the participants. We've got 115 people here. There's a wealth of experience. There's loads of people to learn from. So we want to give you time to, to do that. We want you to try to plan something in, in, a, in a period of time. And we will share those resources that are created today. We will share those today. We then want to, the fourth thing is we want to open up for some more questions. So we've planned some questions, but we want to give you the chance to to ask our panelists the, the, the burning issues that you have. Um, and then five is optional. We will stay behind a little bit after the webinar and you guys can carry on chatting. We, we call that extra time. And then the sixth thing is that we're hoping, well, we're gonna set a home task. I crossed out homework because it didn't sound as much fun, but we're calling it a home task, um, which is we'll, I'll explain more later, but essentially will be, if we get 116 people now, everybody sends in one idea, um, we will collate that and, and send that out so that you've got a resource um, to be working with um, straight away. So they're the six things that we hope we're going to do. But it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our panel. And uh, firstly, I'm going to introduce Rob Sherman. Now, Rob won't be a stranger to any of our audience from Australia, New Zealand or Wales. An ex-professional player for Cardiff, Swansea and Hull. Rob has held coach education and player development roles across the globe, having been the technical director for Wales and Australia and the high performance manager for New Zealand and coached at the Olympics with uh, Canada. Rob has also been the academy director of the Asia Pacific Football Academy and Rob's going to be drawing on all those uh, vast range of experiences to, to help us today. Welcome Rob and thank you for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for leaving everyone. Thank you. And um, our second panellist is Jack Brazil. Jack is the under-12s head coach at Volarenga Football, um, Oslo, Norway. I've got the nod from Jack on my pronunciation there. That's good. Uh, Jack, similarly to, we've got two globetrotters with us today because Jack has plied his trade across seven different countries and has coaching experience across the full range of ages. Um, now, Jack's a great guest for us because... Um, Norway returned to training late April. So Jack has a month of learnings to be able to share with us. And Jack, I saw from you, I didn't know this about you, but I saw from your LinkedIn profile that you were club president of Coventry University. And that's going to be a problem because 20 years before you were doing that, I was uh, um, first in captain of Warwick University. So um, no one else will care about this rival, but me and Jack are going to have to put that aside for the next hour or so. Jack, thank you for joining us and welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. It's, it's really nice to be on um, early morning in Oslo, so it's, uh, it's good to get me out of bed. So uh, with the times that we have at the moment, without being able to work directly in the office all the time, it's, uh, it's good to get some routine, so I appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, thank you guys for, for joining us. And we're, we're going to start um, straight away with, with uh, Rob, if that's okay. So Rob, with, with the current COVID-19 restrictions in Australia that, that Chris outlined, um, I wonder if you can start by just giving the coaches some advice um, for when they're planning their sessions. And then perhaps when you give me the shout, we'll, we'll, we'll share some examples of sessions that you think um, can provide a good example of how we can still provide effective coaching under these restrictions. Yeah, I think uh, one of the first things is obviously to maintain, you know, the, the safety aspect, safe distancing and things of that nature. So some of the habits that would become or be familiar with, you know, the boys putting their drinks all down in the dugout or in an area. They're going to have individual drink stations so they're not actually congregating. Um, you know, you want to maintain distance. There should be no physical contact. 
those types of elements. So just as you're planning that, you, you want to make sure that if you're doing an exercise, two people don't arrive at a station, for instance, or at a cone at the same time. Um, just so you maintain that there's a, a habit that they get into in terms of those types of things. I think also the, the danger is that you can go right down the isolate, isolated end of practice and you, you remove some of the stimuli from the game. And you can replicate that without necessarily having full contact or opposition. So that would be something that perhaps uh, I try and emphasize in the, in the very basic slides I've put together. Uh, how you can maintain some of the stimuli of the ball moving to their teammate, maybe some level of interference, but not significant, um, which would help with perception particularly. So the players are still making decisions, but they would prompt predominantly down the execution end of the scale. Um, so those are things to consider. Um, I think also, you know, you want plenty of ball contact. You don't want people having to wait too long. So whether you have two balls active, or whatever you choose to go for. Just be creative, but uh, understand your limitations in terms of the safety. Okay, Rob, would you like me to share the screen now? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, As I said, sorry, sorry, mate, fire away. No, you go for it. Can you see the screen okay? Yeah, I can. Brilliant. Uh, just uh, very basic in the sense here that, uh, if you, is there a slide prior to that one? I think there is. Uh, no, there isn't, Rob, sorry. <laughs> All right, so just here, I mean, basic circle with one spare cone at any time or whatever you would have in terms of shaping your circle. So the ball player will run to the spare cone. So once you see one exits his cone, that's the spare cone. Three might pass to any of the other numbers and would run to where one was, not where one, you know, etc. The thing I, I would, I would emphasise here, which was in the previous slide, was Everyone starts behind the cone. So the stimuli would be one touching the ball one side or the other, and the other player's moving. So it's not in sequence. It doesn't have to go to one to three to two or whatever. The other player's moving and making themselves available when his head comes up from behind their cone. So there's an external stimuli to the pass. So you maintain the perception element for the ball carrier. So in this case, one might have touched the ball to the right, three steps to the left to receive it. And obviously he touches the ball across the cone in this particular exercise. And obviously then if it's, he's touching it to the right for arguments, that would be a, small, a bigger stimuli for two because it would indicate he's the pass. And two would step out, etc. Now you could change the uh, variations. So for instance, so uh, I just looked here in terms of uh, some of the variations, just to make sure we're on. Yeah, more of a diamond practice. Sorry, mate, if you can go back one, just, uh, just go back one. Just in this one, for instance, you're receiving behind the cone. What you could also do is as the ball's traveling, you meet it in front of the cone as though you've beaten an opponent. So the initial one is you take the ball be across behind the cone or behind the, the pole. As it progresses, you could step in front and, and touch that into play. And that would be the stimuli because your first touch which is the basic direction of who the next pass is likely to be. So the other players on the outside have to be aware. And obviously, if you had more players, you could either have a duplicate practice or more cones active. So there's no limit to what you can do in a basic passing drill like this. For instance, one could drive off their first touch and travel halfway and then pass a shorter pass. So your imagination is limited. If you move to the, nuts, the next one, just a basic diamond practice. So the four cones that are in the foreground and the spare cone at the back. So as one plays and travels, follows their pass, five would occupy the front. So if the ball goes to four, eventually he's got a pass to make. And the four would travel to the next cone because there'd always be one free at that stage. And again here, it's a, a load of stimuli. So you can receive behind the cone, so two passes to three, receive, three receives it one side, transfers it to the other, and this could be evolved into a number of uh, factors. You can progress, in, I think in the next slide we show how you can introduce combination play into this one potentially. Yeah, so um, 
Or you could introduce a combination play. Sorry, go back one again. Sorry, mate. Sorry, Rob. You could actually, you know, travel to the cone or have someone in the middle. I play it to two. He plays me back. I play back to two if I'm one. And then he progresses. There's a whole host of things you can do here. The other thing I would say in these type of environments, although they're very basic and they are, you could have a, for instance, where in this exercise, one is the only active player and you put a time on it to see how quickly he can return to his own cone by passing and combining around the diamond. And that individual uh, motivation to try and beat your own score and make it competitive is a factor where you can alleviate some of the boredom that might come out of more isolated practice. I think that was evident in Jack's video. There was an element of competitiveness in those for start off. If you progress to the next one, uh, this would be a, you know, based on the numbers I had five, and if you had six, you would obviously have two at either end. The two in the middle would be in a box which differentiates. So the ball would switch across from one to two. Three would take a touch, so two balls going at each time. And the four and five then have to be aware of each other. So now you've got the opponent stimulus, although they're not opposing each other. So they're not going to contact, they're not actually taking people on. But they have to find the space in relation to what the opponent gives them. So in this case, for instance, if the ball switches to two and five was to move towards one, four would be left with the space down the side of five on the ball side of th where the three is playing it and occupy that space. So here's where you start to get in things that we call, you know, like the term body shape, but actually body shape is really enables you to see the ball and your opponent. And this is a perfect practice to bring that type of exercise out. And again, you could have a race in this or introduce a number of factors. Um, this is still passing and receiving. And as I said, if you had, a, if you could have even a bigger group in the here, no trouble at all in terms of numbers, but it's a very simple one. Uh, and then you can introduce things like you have to receive it beyond the opponent. So first touch takes you beyond, or you actually have to receive it beyond. So then you have to be really aware of the opponent, both as the ball player and the receiver. So there's any number of aspects you can add to the practice, which in increase the ball opponent teammate space concept in terms of awareness. So not, a, not directly opposed, but opposition becomes a factor. And then if you like, if you move on to another exercise for running and dribbling, simple one here. In its basic form, five is not in the middle. It's a starting case. Four plays three, three and one are going at the same time. They travel and you can make this as many touches or as few touches as you can. And they just play it across to two or four respectively who occupy that space. And it's a, it's a race basically to see who can get to the end and play a accurate pass, good touch out your feet for the receiver. Then you could introduce five, who basically becomes a com combined player on one side. So one's traveling direct, one is combining. Again, you can then progress that into a race where um, after I've played the ball, so if I'm number three, I play the number two, I then chase number two to halfway or something of that nature. So actually put a little bit more pressure on them. So there's again, a multitude of things you can do in that case. And the final one, which again, which I like with Jack's practice uh, very much, well, that's the precursor, if you like, to the previous one is simple. Run as fast as you can to the other end, as few or as many touches as possible. Play it across to the next one who's waiting. And it's just a cyclical event. The only thing you need to be uh, mindful of here is there's a physicality with this. So depending on the age of the players, et cetera, you have to ma manage your work to rest ratios and things of that nature. I think the last one then is a, a goal in the a game into goal. So four servers, two goals, and they could be small goals, etc. You uh, and again, how you do this, but ultimately, you might run to the cone in this example away from the server. Server serves you. You could go two touch finish, one touch finish, small goals, poles in the side, or whatever the case is. You work around each of the corners. So after you've shot into that goal, you would run round the cone of the goal you've just shot into, if that makes sense, receive the ball from one of the others and shoot. Obviously, if you had keepers, you could put them in because they're not directly affecting that. Uh, and you make it a, a 30, 40 second game 
see how many runs you can make, how many goals you get, and one in, one out. You could then change the service. So this time, if I run around the, as in this visual, run around the cone where the dotted line is, a four would serve me, not three. So I'm then running onto the ball, which is a lot more realistic to a game situation. So, you know, I guess I score from cutbacks, but often I'm running onto a ball. So a slightly different technique. And uh, again, a bit more stimulating with goals. And uh, you could potentially have a defender come out and close down the goal, et cetera, et cetera, and limit the shooting opportunity. But these are very basic exercises that look at the five core skills uh, in, in essence, you know, sending and receiving, running and dribbling with the ball, first touch, which is in the passing and receiving, and here obviously striking the ball with, with shooting. So just some very basic ideas. I would recommend that you, you basically work through maybe six or seven activities in your session because of the boredom factor. So variety is something that you know, after you've done any of those a couple of times, you want to progress onto something else. And therefore, that's the key, is you have six or seven activities, they rattle through them, you're not really coaching, they're experiencing by just doing it a lot. The other thing, the thing that you might coach is the cues, the stimulus. So, you know, in this particular exercise, as the player's coming round the cone, you'd be touching the ball out your feet if you were three. So they, they can judge pace, judge the pass you play them, arrive the same time as the ball, strike the ball early, etc. So those cues become essential ingredients. But you can give those on the run. You don't have to stop the activity. So that's pretty much a, a very basic formation in this. And, and once we get to more opposed practice, and there might be limitations on that in terms of opposing space as it comes, then obviously you could do the same practice, but three comes out and defends their pass. So you would still only have a situation where, um, but there, it's passive defending. So you can introduce more as you're going. Increase the numbers, decrease, etc. So uh, just some basics, very basic indeed. Um, I know, just see someone there, Nick Roberts just asked a question, you know, when you say, yeah, definitely progressions within the exercise. So you would start off with something basic, make it a bit more complex, and then progress to another exercise, basic, complex, and so on. So you should have a few variations within the same exercise because inevitably there is a learning, learning to do the exercise and then learning from the exercise. And that's where the frustration comes with the coaches. Often we're impatient and we move it on before they've actually learnt the exercise and therefore they don't learn from the exercise. Thank you, Rob. Look, it's, uh, it, it, it's brilliant stuff. And um, everybody who's, who's sort of scribbling down, you, you can relax a little bit and listen because we will share those with you tonight. You'll be able to download those, um, sort of Rob's session ideas and Jack's session ideas to, to, um, today. Um, so you'll be able to do that. And uh, good to know that in terms of variety, um, having six or, or, or so ideas a session, we, like I said, we've got now 126 people on here. So um, the resource that we create after there, we'll, we'll, we'll have lots to choose from. Yeah, we're stuffed if they all do the same one, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want kids over the world doing the same, exactly the same session. So, uh, I'm not playing Jack. <laughs> what's that? we are playing Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that might be happening. Uh, Jack, um, I'm going to come to you now, if that's all right. Um, Norway, as I said, returned to training a few weeks ago. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the process you went through as a coach preparing for this. Love it if you could share with us any mistakes that you made um, along the way. Um, How long have we got? <laughs> well, maybe just the major mistakes that you made or the main <laughs> ones. And then uh, uh, what that will lead us into is, is then sharing, um, I think, about five of your uh, COVID-19 sessions. Yeah. Um, so we, we, the country itself got permission to train again on April 20th. We took an extra week as a club to sort of sit down and discuss how we were going to do this safely. Um, we saw a lot of grassroots clubs around us starting up again and there was some, I would say, inadequate practice that wasn't reflected in the rules. They weren't respecting the rules either. Um, so we had to think of a sort of a game plan of how we were going to do this. So the first thing that we did um, was we split all of the 
pitches that we have. So we have three full size pitches and two um, like seven aside pitches. And we split the full size pitches into eight areas of eight. So into sort of eight and we split the seven aside into half. Um, so, that, so for example, at the start of it, we could only have four players plus one coach per eight or per half on the seven aside pitch. So that was the first thing that we did to make sure that the rules were completely and utterly um, respected. Uh, the first session, I didn't really think about it. I just told the kids to turn up. Um, and as kids do, they haven't seen each other in seven weeks. They all push and shove and stand in the corner and put all their stuff down. Um, so that was my first mistake that I really made. Um, so then what I learned really quickly was I had to be even more detailed with my planning. So I would then send out the pitch map to the players. You report to this area, this area, this area, this area. And then I had specific colored cones. So I would say, for example, um, Jonas, you go to the green cone. Um, Peter, you go to the red cone. And I'd put them in their specific areas. So then they would stand on their cone and wait. And once we'd done it twice, it's become habit now. So even though those rules have been relaxed and we're now allowed groups of 14, um, maximum two goalkeepers in that group plus one coach, so 15 in total. Um, they still do that thing where they turn up. I don't even put the cones down now. They automatically have got in the pattern. They put their equipment down one metre away from each other, right by the pitch, and they stand and they wait for training to start. So the, the, the patterns of behaviours of, of how we arrive and the, and the rules have become much tighter and much better as we've got more experience. Um, and that was, you know, that was the, the key thing was then and the excitement. Um, another thing that we learned that was really positive was the, the sort of social and psychological element. They hadn't seen each other or been out for six, seven weeks. Um, and they, 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 their contact had been with a computer screen doing school for three hours, four hours um, a day maximum. Most kids were doing four hours. So it was really, really important for us um, to understand that they were going to be so excited, socially so like, wow, I can train again. So we had to almost temper that and be aware that they were going to be really excited and we couldn't do so much coaching in those first few sessions until we slowly sort of brought that focus and their standards back to where we wanted it to be. I think that was true across all the groups that they hadn't had that discipline. Um, I've seen it. Uh, I said it before, like, God, God bless all the parents at this moment because they must be, driving, must be going crazy. I had them for the first two hours after seven weeks and I was like, pulling my hair out because they were so excitable um so it, it, it is, is one of those things i think the main thing was the rules and also the social psychological side that i just didn't see i didn't see coming yeah thank you thank you jack yeah i've written down three tips there straight away so i really appreciate that um are you okay to talk us through um some of your sessions now there's about um you sent us about 15 i think i've selected about five so but everybody will, will get all of them but we, we chose these five as a good examples i think of, of the sorts of things okay. that you've been doing okay you see that yes got it so one of the things that we started with um when we were doing this was we, we when we had groups of four we split them into position specific groups so this was more one that we did with the centre backs and the, and the central midfielders, uh, not so much the forwards. Uh, so it started off with uh, the red in the top left hand corner would pass the ball to the right top hand corner and to the bottom. And they would just pass around the outside of the big red cones. They wouldn't pass through the centre. So we passed around the middle. However, if you receive the ball, so say the, the top left has just received the ball, the bottom right could show in a gap and then receive between the cones. So the way we saw it was almost the centre back switching the play and then it'd be the number six coming to show. Or it could be, for example, the full back on the ball in the top left and the wingers coming to show. And then the winger or the, the player who's dropped into show must play sort of round the corner. Um so that was the first sort of idea of it. Um and it got it got it got some um some good practice. We worked on technically um, receiving the ball with an open body shape, and knowing where we're going to go next, and also checking before we receive. Is the person diving off? Is it, are they dropping? Is that an option? Or shall I just continue to circulate the ball? Um, and then we worked on the eye contact. So when there was eye contact between the player diagonal, that was the trigger to know if he's going to drop in. Now I can play through. Um, and then after we got to that, we got to the next progression of when you play through, the person who's played the pass. So for example, if the top left in this instance passes into bottom right, then and the bottom right then plays to the bottom left, if you're still following me, 
the free player who hasn't been involved would swap with the player who's passed it on other sides of the current. So that would be sort of a, maybe it could be the forward swapping positions or it could be just a change of angle for the centre back who's so passed the ball forwards and then he's making a new angle so he can support behind the play quickly. Um, and we then progressed it into a competition element. That's really key in these moments. So we'd have two of these boxes side by side, obviously within different eights. Um, and they would go on by uh, competing who could get the most passes. Then it might be who could play the throw, most through passes. It could be then how long can you play without basically making a mistake or messing it up. And it would be, we'd have lots of competitions regarding that. And uh, we saw some really good uh, sort of development in these players, uh, understanding of when to go forwards, when to just keep the ball over that sort of uh, two-week period. However, we found it started to get repetitive after probably the second or third session, so we had to move it on to, a, to another um, way of doing things. Exercise two, um, again, we worked this particularly with the central midfielders or the centre-backs. Um, we also worked a little bit with the, with the wing-backs. Um, the left-sided uh, red would play into the centre red, and then he'd switch it out to the right red, and they continue to switch the play. Uh, until the central red decided, okay, I can break forwards now. And he'd take the step forwards, which is sort of characterized by the, the purple arrow. And then he'd look for a shot into the free goal. So the blue's job effectively to start with was just to stand in one of the goals. And that was one that you couldn't pass because he represented a defender and the free goals represented basically a, a central midfielder showing, or it could be a striker showing if we're doing it with the central midfielders. So it'd be that element of receiving perception, where's the free area? scoring on that three um, or the two free mini goals. Um, and then we added another progression whereby the blue could then stand in front and block. So then we'd start to work on our disguised passing. So how can we position our body, our hips, our shoulders, our eyes to fool the defender and score on the free goal. So we were still maintaining our one, uh, well, we, we went for a two meter distance, but we were still maintaining those um, elements and, and working on supporting and switching play. And then when do we go forwards? When are we comfortable going forwards? When do we have enough control to go forwards? And then playing the correct pass to the correct area based on the opponent. Yep, uh, this was about sort of, again, we could term it as the two centre backs and the six, or we could term it as potentially the two centre midfielders and the number nine. And then this would be, the, the blue would be the screen in front. So the reds would maintain the ball, and if possible, they would play into the Reds, who would then turn and score. If the Blue could intercept, he would score on the other mini goal. Sometimes we went with one mini goal each side, if we're working on particularly playing through the centre, and then we could go with two mini goals wide, depending if we're going to go with like wide movements from the striker or progressing wide. Um, and then again, similar things to the first exercise, it was checking before we received the ball. Is he showing? Is he just standing off? Is he interested? Have we got eye contact? Can we take that step to go forwards? Is there the opportunity there? And then particularly the centre midfielders, a progression we had was when the ball went into the nine, the player who didn't pass the ball could come and support. So we do an up, back, and then it would be a through to go into one of the mini goals. So we started adding some more tactical elements there. Number 11, this is probably um, my favourite exercise right now and the kids' favourite exercise, they love it. Um, so the two blues would have the ball, for example, now um, on the near side to us, and they would try and circulate the ball between themselves to penetrate either by passing through to the blue on the other side, which would represent the striker, or they would try and score on the mini goals um, on the other side. The reds can defend in one box at a time. So if one red's in one box, you can't be joined. They can't be in the same box. They must shift as a pair. Um, and if the, so for example, if the blues play through, then the, the striker blue can then turn and score a goal um, on that element, on that area. Or if they scored on the mini goal the blues did, I would then just play a little lofted pass into the striker blue so we could receive and finish within three touches maximum. Um, and then if the reds block it, then it just goes the other way. So it's just a game. For the goalkeepers, it worked really well because they got the communication element of telling um, their stoppers or their centre backs or their centre midfielders, whichever the two were in front, what was going on behind them, helping them shield and they were involved in some more game realistic practice in there um, rather than just an isolated train themselves. The strikers, so the forwards, the, two, the ones at the end, um, they were working really well on their movements, the sort of eye contact show, make an angle, how can we do it, our perception skills 
and the forwards exactly the, the centre backs or the centre midfielders, the two players exactly the same. They're working on their perception skills. When do they make eye contact? Is it a good time to go forwards? Have we imbalanced the opponent? Can we do so? And how can we do that? Uh, and then we started adding progressions for disguised passes that we worked on in the exercise two, I think it was. So our um, hips, our shoulders, our eyes, how can we fake that we go one way and then cut back another way? How can we have a trigger that our striker knows we're going to do that? And how can we build that from there? And the final one was very similar um, to what we've just done. So it's building up against sort of a two striker press. Um, and then we have our three midfielders. So we have our six is the blue one inside the red boxes and then our eight and our 10 hiding behind the mannequins. And we have our two central uh, centre backs that are building up as the blues right now. And then we have our two striker press in the red. So we were working on uh, basically only one blue can drop into the boxes and he can't drop into the same box as either of the reds. So they must defend the reds um, and, and just work as a shield. Uh, and then if the blues can play through, they can the two stoppers, the two centre-backs could play to any of the blues um, that they wanted to ahead of them. If they did that, then it was a combination of the three. So they'd have to all combine with some kind of up back through or potentially a one, two, and then around the corner. Um, we put the mannequins in just so they had some kind of extra opposition. So they were having some more stimuli of what was going on. And then if the reds won the ball, they would quickly try and pass back and sort of counter attack. So we were working on them winning the ball, looking up, where are the mini goals? And, try and score on the mini goals the other side. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing those with us. We really, we really appreciate okay. that. Um, loads to take in, loads of ideas already. Um, and like I say, we will be sharing um, the, the documents where, where they have come from. Um, and in a minute, we're going to give you guys a chance to interact with each other and um, create at least one idea, hopefully. Um, but before we do uh, go into those breakout rooms, Warren, have you got any sort of key messages that have, have come through from, from Rob and um, Jack that will help guide the coaches thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Again, there's so much to take from it and um, great amount of uh, detail. Um, but when you actually see them up there, it's, uh, it, it, it's clear as day as to there is so much that you can do. So uh, just starting off with, with, with Rob and then leading into to Jack, 100% uh, stick with the guidelines, uh, maintain the safety. Um, and whilst doing that, uh, that is very, very important as part of your pre-planning. Um, so to ensure that there is a plan in place, so it's not turn up, it's off the cuff. Um, the group should already be uh, designed based on the session that you're actually delivering. Um, with the sessions that we've actually seen, try not to go straight down the, the avenue of the isolated routes, can we find a, a, a happy medium um, and make sure that there is that stimuli there where potentially we can still get elements of perception, decision making and execution. Um, if we can add variation to stop uh, kids potentially getting bored of one activity, so an example with Rob's there, he had six or seven different um, activities or progressions within an activity uh, to keep the stimuli there and to keep the players motivated and to keep the energy levels up. I think that's also important from an intensity point of view because um, with the restrictions that are currently in place, the intensity can potentially go down. So here's an opportunity by adding those progressions in to increase that stimuli and therefore increasing the intensity of your sessions as well. And, and not to do too much coaching. Um, coaching on the runs, you coach the cues and coach on the run. Um, less is more. And uh, going into Jack's collaboration, uh, I think a pitch, mi uh, a pitch map is absolutely fantastic as well. So when players and parents turn up to the session, they know exactly where they need to be signposted to, where they're going to, and what they're going to be doing within that session. Again, Jack touched on the plan and prepare. Um, and depending on the stage of development, uh, consider the psychosocial. They're just coming back. They're going to be excited. It's going to be the first opportunity to connect with uh, their friends uh, for a while, I'm sure. Um, but we want to make sure that it's fun, but fun in a safe environment. And there's nothing wrong with chaos. But what you've seen with both of those sessions, that there's direction and there's goals as well. So you can still have the elements of chaos, but there can still be purpose to the session with direction. Um, lots of touches, lots of repetition. And uh, finally, what I would say is, is that even though there's no contact, you can still keep it specific potentially to 
positions on the pitch. So Jax went into detail there and he actually talked about centre-backs. He talked about wingers. Um, and that might be something as part of your pre-planning to actually do you put your defenders with your attackers as an example. So when you're looking at splitting the groups, you're only allowed 10, which includes your coaches. Which are the players that you need in this session? Is Depending on the stage of development, is it related to the position that they actually play in? Or if they're the younger ones, are you happy for them to rotate positions around and give them an opportunity to play in many different positions, but actually giving elements specific to the game itself, whether they're playing 7v7, 9v9, or 11v11 in, um, as they move up. But there's definitely elements across the board where it keeps that realism uh, throughout the session. Perfect. Thank you, Warren. Great summary, mate. Great summary. Um, look, we're going to put you into uh, breakout rooms in a minute. Our regulars will know how those work, but we realise we've got a, a few people for the, the first time. So I will spend a little bit of time just explaining that. Um, so to do that, I'm just going to share my screen because something that I hope you have downloaded is the, um, the FFA session planning template, which we'll use in the breakout rooms today. If you've got another program or something else, that, that's fine. Um, but we thought we'd provide something for you to, to go with. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, and hopefully, Chris, thumbs up. We've got a, yeah, excellent, okay. So look, when you go on it, you'll have sort of 11 red players, 11 blue players. I've sort of just um, had, I, I spent about eight minutes on this earlier, just putting something together. Forget the ideas, it's just to show you how it can work. So we've got our, our four areas here. Um, in this area here, we've um, got a, a 2v2 and they're locked in, very similar to the, one, the video that we saw before and the one that Jack presented, and they're either trying to score in the mini goal or they're trying to find their mates um, behind. And here, um, a little bit more isolated, we've got pass, pass, finish, while the Reds are going pass, pass, finish. Now, the purpose of this is not to, to show you those ideas, but just to show you how to use these things. So um, quite easily, hopefully, let's see if it is easy yet, yeah, we can move players around, okay, if we want a ball, we can, we can obviously copy and, and paste, and we've got a, a ball that we can use. If I want to um, put in a, a playing area, then I, I, can, I, can, I can do that. Okay. Um, so my recommendation is the person that shares the screen, which I'll show you, I'll talk to you about in a minute, is somebody that's okay on, on PowerPoint. Okay. That's probably how you're going to judge who, who shares their, their screen. Okay. Um, so if I just progress my slide. When we put you into the breakout rooms, definitely put your cameras and your microphones on if you can. I'm going to try to put you in groups of three. Okay, welcome back um, everybody. Um, there's two things that I would uh, like us to do if possible. And number one will be, uh, if this has worked, Brilliant, and it doesn't matter if it hasn't, but if, if, if it's possible to um, put the file that you uh, saved as a screenshot into the chat function, um, just title it room, whatever number, plan, or something similar, that will enable everybody here to download those at the moment. Now, obviously, our more detailed work will come after this session, but there might be some nuggets in there um, that you've thought about already. I've also put in the chat function Rob's document and Jack's document, and you should be able to download those straight away, so you don't have to wait for a follow-up email um, from me. Um, and the second thing is in that chat function, if you can start to put some, some questions that, that have probably arisen from your chats with people in those rooms for Rob and Jack, any specifics, you know, now you've gone through that process of planning, was there any things that you were saying, well, how do we do this, well, you know, what should we do here? and pop those in the chat function and, and, and Chris and Drew will be monitoring those and we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to ask some of those um, as well. Just a reminder as you come back, if you can um, just turn off your videos and your uh, microphones, um, um, unless Chris or, or Drew ask you to put, put it on to ask a question, that would be great. While we do that, so we'll do a bit of multitasking, um, I'm gonna go to my um, three co-hosts and just ask them a question. And it's a really quick answer um, and the question is, one piece of advice um, that you think is really worth making at, at this moment? And um, I'll, go, I'll go to you first, Drew, if that's okay. One piece of advice. 
Yeah, sure. I think uh, for me, it's probably a temptation to try and um, design sessions sort of from the ground up, but I would be thinking uh, it's probably worth saying, well, if the match is the starting point for what we've already designed, we've then designed a, a session that for normal trainings that would replicate that match. So probably then work back from that again to work out how what you already wanted to do can maybe be adjusted towards the towards the regulations so that you're just peeling back the the contact or how close they would do rather than trying to sort of start from scratch with what you design. Yeah, good advice. Chris, one nugget, uh, maybe different from Drew's. <laughs> no, uh, for me, I think it's, uh, I shared the article from Frank Lampard about Chelsea going back to training uh, and I think it's now now important more than ever to put the player first in whatever we're designing and that obviously links into safety links into what they've been missing um and and then that's obviously that connection with the players it's the connection with the game so the elements around the competition having fun enjoying it so for me it's uh, for us as coaches now more than ever we need to think about the players and put them first uh, in all aspects when we're designing our sessions brilliant thank you very much chris and warren seeing us uh, us with the final bit of advice? Yeah, the, the pre-planning and preparing of the sessions, a collaboration, a collaboration approach to that. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in grassroots. If you're a coach, engage your players because they'll come up with nuggets themselves. If you're in the, uh, the older age groups um, and exactly with your technical directors, your, your coaching team, make sure that you plan and prepare. And most importantly, go through the conduct, but do some serious evaluation because it's flexible. We will all make mistakes, as Jack said from, at the start, but as we move through it, it should become more fluid. It'll be more consistent. People will get used to it um, and keep it simple, stupid. We don't have to overdo it. Uh, less is more sometimes, less is more. Thank you, Warren. Look, before we get to any additional questions, I, I, I'd like to try this and if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, but let, let's give it a go. Um, Room one, Sean Darcy. I wonder if you're able to share your screen and, and, and talk to us um, to the, the session that you started to create. We don't, we don't expect any, anything to be totally finished, but uh, if that's possible, that would be great. Is that, is that okay? Yep, got it, Sean. Yeah, Good for me. All right, so like, this is, this is um, cause obviously in WA, we're already back and uh, we kept to the 10 player as well. And so what, what we did, this was an under 18 team. It's an under 18 team that's uh, playing 4 2 2 2. So the problem they had in the last set, last game that they, or the last couple of games I've seen them play, is that the sixes and nines didn't work as a pair. So we just set up a little like a, a rondo positioning game where the blues are trying to get the ball into the six and they, they screen in front. But if you, if you can see there, we've got three three squares. And the same as like Jack said in his thing, no, you can only have one player in a square at a time. And then we're trying to get, get the blues are trying to get the ball from one end to the other. The oranges are trying to force them wide. And then there's this little, little bit here, which is the 1.5 meters where you're allowed to put your foot in to intercept, but not allowed to go in. So that the nines and sixes can move up and down in that square. If the nines win it, they bang it into one of the pub goals. They play forward as quick as we can because even though I've got the numbers like that, it's bi-directional. You either go up and then you go down for the blues. So the blues get a point if the six can get hold of the ball. Gets two points if he can play a pass through the screens. And the oranges get a point every time they intercept and two points if they can knock it into a pub. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can stop sharing the screen now, Sean, that would be brilliant. But that's a, that's a great job. And it is, it is coincident, coincidental that, um, you know, you're from Western Australia and you've already had some um, experience doing that. So that was a, a good choice by me. Um, excellent. Um, had the power to get rid of you. Um, <laughs> let's, let's try one more of those. Um, if this person's still there. Sam Gray from Room Six, are you are you able to to share? You had yeah. something pre-prepared, I think. So, um... hey, how are we all? Hello, Sam. How are you, mate? Good to see you. All right, here we go. Can you see that? Yes, we can. All right. So, obviously, 
I ran a practice session with a, um, players the other day. So I had two players that was two coaches. So we, we were videoing it so that we could show it to the club in a private setting. So here, the, the player here at the bottom. So I'm going to try using a pen online. No, it's not going to work. This player here delivers the ball to the player in the middle. Meanwhile, the coach at the back will hold up colored cone, which forces the player in the middle to scan. They then have to make their way. If he pulls up yellow, the player has to go around the yellow cone, back in the mid, pass back to here, receive it back, turn and have a shot at the pug. Once that ball's dead, we get reset, but the player in the middle has to stay on their toes all the time. So we're looking for them to be alert and aware what's going on. The coach who, or the extra player who's behind the pug goal, if, the, if they hold up the yellow cone, they'll hold it up on this side so that the player has a bit of perception and decision-making to make. Because if you hold it up on this side, that the player's going to run there. So we held up the opposites to try and grow the session a bit more. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me, yes, definitely. Uh, thank and you. And the final addition we had, we had, I'll just get rid of those things that I've put on there. We had here a passing gate, which introduced challenge for the ball deliverer as well. So the ball deliverer was passing and receiving through the passing gate all the time. So that there was a challenge for the player was moving down as well. Now each player can rotate so that everyone would have an opportunity at the three stations. I felt that with nine players, the coach would have his work. It's good warm-up session, you can adapt it, but the coach would be moving constantly. However, this way the coach can see the three <laughs> sessions that he's running on his half of the pitch and take it from there. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sam. And good to consider, you know, the coach's management of that as well. Thank you. Okay, look, really, really appreciate uh, Sean and, and um, Sam stepping in there. They, they didn't know till about two minutes before the, um, the end um, that that was going to happen. But uh, excellently done. We've got some future presenters on here, I think. Um, Listen, uh, I think Chris and Drew might have been having a look at some uh, questions in, in, in the chat. Um, Drew, have you got anything, uh, additional questions for Jack and Rob? Yeah, I'll go with the first one. So one that flew in there from a Brian. So Jack, it was around. So no, no games mm -hmm. at the moment or no, no matches on a weekend and some concerns in some quarters around whether kids will still be motivated to, to train when there's not a, a game coming up how how was that experience for you and do the kids still still buzzing to get out there and train despite the lack of a match the the, the kids are just wanting to get back to normality now um I, I don't think that they ask pretty much every session um when's the next game when's the next game um one of the best things that we had probably in the last week was one of the players came up to me and went oh, i feel like we're getting closer to real football now um so it's just about giving them enough so they really enjoy it and being competitive enough in the training. And th th there is light at the end of the tunnel. We got news today that on June 15th, we'll be able to play contact again um, for all ages under 19. So that's positive. Uh, what that contact looks like, we're not sure yet how it looks, whether it means we can play games, we're not sure, but we've been told there's some form of contact coming on the 15th of June. So that I think it's just having that that idea that it will come soon and they just have to be patient but most of the kids are just happy to be playing football again they're not so bothered about the matches and so on and so forth because they've been starved of what they love for so long Brilliant. chris i think we'll we'll take uh at least one more question have you got, have you got one in there yeah, there's 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 one sent um in the chat to me uh from from phil which is around uh so probably link it to Rob after we had that one for Jack, but just around phases of play um, and if that might be something to consider um, for some practices that might meet the social distancing guidelines. Yeah, actually, um, I was just thinking of that and I'd actually put something together in that period if I, I want to show that or I could share the screen, I could take through uh, a, a little discussion on that if, if uh, anyone was interested particularly. Yeah, go on, you should be able to share screen, Rob. 
Okay, let's just go to full. So basically, you could do a do a passing practice where the reds, if you like, uh, or a phase of play, the reds are uh, passive at this stage, totally passive, and are only going to move marginally. So as the ball shifts, say, as the arrow goes across the screen there, one could move laterally or horizontally. If they move laterally, this player switches it back, this one steps in, etc. Sorry, and this one steps in, and then they progress the ball. On the progression, once they reach a pass, you could play, put some cones down. They play the yellow, who then gives the ball to red, and then in essence, blues narrow off, and reds work on patterns and maybe go into gold. So if you just work out the type of stimuli, so on the previous, on the very first feedback we had, play with the 4-4-2, the strikers don't, you know, uh, the two don't work well. You could actually replicate this here by, if you wanted, putting another striker in there, having two up front and two in midfield behind and working on keeping them on the outside. And then if you were to win it from a turnover, say, at your fullback position, the ball's fed back into your six, who quickly plays the 10, they combine centrally and have a shot on goal. Then you can work on the, the two elements, both your attacking phase or your defending phase in attack, and then your counter phase with the attackers, relatively simple. You would just have to analyze some of your games to see what type of uh, defending or attacking movements your defenders struggle with, and what type of um, situation you maybe you're not capitalizing on in the transition moment, or any moment for that matter. Quite easy to organize, but you could definitely work on phases of play without, um, you know, breaking any of the guidelines in terms of of how that works. You could even have the pitch gridded. So, you know, you pitch the grid out in sort of four meter squares or, and there's never more than two in a square. So um, I'm sure you could, you could work on that and stay well within the boundaries. But it's quite easy to do something in that phase. You just, it's got to be relevant to what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. Look, what, what's going to happen now then is, um, I'm going to sort of tie up this session um and just explain what's going to happen next so that we, we we get a great resource out of it um just going to lead into explaining uh, what happens next and then for anybody that wants to stay around jack and rob you're, you're more than welcome but you you, you know you, you've given us a, a lot of your time so don't feel that you you have to but uh, what we normally do is we have an extra time a sort of 10 minutes that replicates the end of the workshop where people stay around and chat um and um anybody that wants to stay around for that you're you're, you're more than welcome so I'm just going to go back to my uh, screen share. So look, this is what we want to do. We want, we want to create and share a community of practice resource um, to support each other now. But, you know, everything that we've seen today is, uh, is really good practice anyway. And one of the questions I would like to ask in the extra time is, is you know, what, perhaps if, if, you know, what, what, what Jack learned from this session this time that he's going to keep. He's been forced to do certain things. But are there some things that you think, well, actually, why didn't I do this um, anyway? Um, so what I would like is I, I would like everybody here uh, to send an activity uh, session plan to me. That, that's my email there. And I think everybody got it when they registered. Um, try to use that um, session plan template that we had so that it looks the same. But if it's, if it's you know, scribbled notes and a, a photo taken of it, that's absolutely fine as well. We really don't, don't mind. This isn't going to be the best looking resource. It will just be the best resource in terms of quality. Um, and a 24 hour turnaround, I'd like to get this out um, before the weekend um, for people so they can have a look at it over the weekend and start planning for, for next week and beyond. If we end up with 10, that's great. If we end up with 100, even better. So that's our, that's our plan. Um, okay. Um, going forward, Chris, is Chris still there? Yeah, I'm still on. Chris, you were gonna talk to the first half of the slide there. Yeah, so just uh, one of the areas around is obviously going back and we've had a lot of clubs get in touch with us around the um, getting access to things like hand sanitizer and that club club protection stuff uh, for your players, like the hand sanitizer stations and the uh, uh, and some of the PPE stuff that you that you might want to buy for um, for your players and for the club. Uh, so the so the guys at Best Team Sport, who I know do a lot of work here in New South Wales, they've they've gone into that range uh, to sort of support the grassroots clubs. Uh, so if you if you want to drop JK a line on on there, feel free. Thank you. 
And look, this uh, th this um, webinar will be um, put up onto the ACP channel, um, YouTube channel, uh, like like the other ones um, that, that are up there at the moment. So we'll get that up as soon as we can. Um, and back to our normal Mondays. So uh, Monday, we're we're looking at identify, we're discussing and looking at identifying and developing talented players. We've got Jacob Nash from FC Norgeland, and if I struggled with uh, Jack's uh, teams, I, I've definitely struggled with that. But they have some ambitious yeah. um, claims around um, talent development. Um, one of the youngest teams in in Europe, and have an ambition of having a a first team solely made out of academy graduates. So really interested in, in what they do. Uh, we've got Matthew Conning from Crown Football, um, an agency that looks after over thirty professional players and. Really interested to find out how they, a uh, different perspective on how talent is developed, or maybe away from the pitch. And our very own Drew uh, Taylor will be joining us and sharing his experiences um, from the talent support program and his experience as player development manager, um, boys for, for, for uh, Football New South Wales. So really looking forward to that session on, on Monday. Um, and finally then, okay, um, I'm going to thank our... Our guests, Rob and Jack, um, you're more than welcome to stay, but um, I understand if, if you've got places to, to go, we, we, we've taken a lot of your time. But Rob and Jack, on behalf of everybody, really appreciate your, your expertise and, and taking time to support coaches at this, this time. There hasn't been, I don't think, many sessions like this, and, and I hope the coaches out there have really appreciated the opportunity to listen to you and, and chat with each other. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I, unfortunately, I've got to dive out, but thanks very much for the opportunity. And uh, good luck to everyone, and uh, get back on the turf and enjoy yourselves. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Rob. Speak soon, mate. Rob, thank you. Thank you.